This is the third video in the series on draw FPP and uh, classical flow-based programming. First, we're going to talk about scheduling rules in classical FPP, which I feel is pretty much at the heart of FPP and, and learning to work with it. Unlike conventional programming, these five processes run concurrently uh, or interleaved, depending on the availability of resources. Um, they're all receiving and sending data at the same time, and uh, these connections are what's called uh, bounded buffers in the literature, so they can hold up to some maximum number of information packets. If um, one of these bounded buffers goes empty, then the receiver will be suspended um, on the receive um, call until some data arrives. If this connection is full, then the send to this connection will be suspended until there's space for some data to be delivered. There is also an end of stream state in the connection, which happens when all of the upstream processes connected to that connection have closed down and there's no more data in the connection itself. In FPP, we allow multiple processes to feed into one connection, but we don't allow the reverse. Um, how does this whole process get started? Well, um, it, it's not like a control flow where maybe it's a process over on the left-hand side that calls everybody else. In fact, in theory, everything could be started at the same time because the first time uh, decompose does a receive, there won't be any data, so it just gets suspended until the data arrives. However, we found that it's a better use of resources to suspend the, uh, the start of the process until that some data arrives because that gives us certain capabilities that we will go into later and it doesn't waste resources unnecessarily. In fact, you could have large chunks of a network that basically never get activated at all. So what's the rule for starting a network? Basically, all processes that have no non-IIP connection, input connections will start up at the beginning. So, for example, this read file um, has an IIP, which is, uh, remember, that's an initial IP. That's sort of like a parameter at this point, and it's passive. So this is, even though it has an IIP connected, this is basically a no input connection process. So that starts at the beginning of the job, sends out some data. As soon as the data arrives, this process can be activated or started. Then a little bit later, this one, a little bit later, this one, a little bit later, this one. Now they're all running essentially interleaved or concurrently. How do processes close down? Well, the rule is that a process closes down when all of its upstream processes have closed down. So here's a picture of um, what I call the process life cycle. And I just want to make the point that the process invokes the component and the first thing it does is it activates the component. We use this term because there's a matching term, deactivate. Um, deactivation occurs right after the component returns, does a return. But the uh, return is not enough to bring down the process. Uh, that decision is made by the scheduler based on whether all input streams have been drained. And all upstream processes have been uh, closed down. If this is true, if everything has been drained and closed down, then the uh, component program is not re-invoked, is not reactivated, but uh, um, various closed down activities start to take place and the process terminates. Now we're going to take this diagram and make it a little bit more complex. 
First, we're going to move these four blocks down out of the way because they, uh, they're, they're not going to change in what comes next. So to do that, we use this function called enclosure. And um, that's really just a way of drawing a boundary around a part of the diagram. It's used for various different functions. In this case, we're going to use it to drag a piece of the diagram. So we create a block, give it a name, doesn't much matter what, bring that down a little bit, adjust the corners so that they surround the piece that we'll want to move. Um, we're going to um, delete this arrow just temporarily. And now right click on the top part here and it says drag contents. So this can come down, then we'll delete it because we don't need it anymore. As I said, we're going to be reading a bunch of files. And you notice that read file uses this thing called the initial IP, IIP, which uh, specifies the um, file name. Now, the IIP arose out of the fact that in the first implementation of flow-based programming, um, we gave the processes arguments, which could be any kind of data structure. But then we realized that um, there were times when you might want this data to be variable. And then, of course, you wanted it to behave like an IP information packet. So somebody suggested that we create a mechanism where you can specify the data right in the network. But the first time the component does a receive on that port, it'll be turned into a regular IP. And then it has to be processed just like regular IPs. So this is not a type of port um, because as far as the component is concerned, there's no difference. For as far as the network, the scheduler is concerned, it does behave slightly differently because it can't trigger an activity, whereas a regular IP can. We're going to feed a series of file names as IPs across this same connection. Uh, the reader um, normally takes a single file name, but if it receives a stream of file names uh, into the source port by the scheduling rules that we described earlier on in the video, um, it's going to keep getting reactivated for every new file. It doesn't know that it's only being asked to read one file or many files. As far as it's concerned, it does a return, but then there's more data, so it gets reactivated. So I didn't have to change this component in any way at all to get it to read a series of files. Now, how are we going to generate this series of file names? Well, we're reading through the directories that uh, we uh, were asked to scan. And some of the lines in the directories, some of the entries are going to be file names. So they can be fed straight out along this path. Others are going to be directories in their own right. So they're going to be fed back around into this process, which we'll call, um, call it uh, uh, list directories, something like that. Um, so these are going to be the files. So we'll give it two output ports. One is files. And it'll, of course, need one which is directories. That'll come out here or some output direction. Um, we, in Flowbase program, we don't like to feed a connection back into the same component, into the same process. So we put another one, another process in place, which is our workhorse component that we has a fairly obvious function to simply everything that comes in just get passed through. So here the output will be directories 
and we feed that in. Didn't give myself a lot of room. Click on there. And it's not out, it's going to be directories. There's. And of course, this, the output of this is the input to this guy. There. Now, you may wonder how does this uh, whole thing start because only processes that have no non IIP input connections can start. And you see, all of these have input connections. So you're basically just going to get a deadlock. So we use another little simple process called kick with data. And that is, will also be the way we'll get the data into the, this, um, start the whole thing going. And uh, it'll need an IIP specifying the initial, the whole folder that you're starting the whole thing with. So that goes down here. IIP, just call it test data, and connect it up. There we go. There's your finished program. And when you filled in component names here, here, and here, um, generate your code, it runs. And the last thing we have to do is do a save as, and we'll call it Scander, which I think exists already. There we go of right existing file, and we're done. Now that we have this diagram, there are a couple of considerations when working with loop topologies. The first question, I guess, is uh, how do we bring it down? Since by the rule I gave earlier, a process can only terminate if all of its upstream processes have terminated and the um, uh, connections have all been drained. So clearly, that's not going to happen in this kind of thing. So one of the components has to decide to bring the loop down. In this case, the obvious one is list di directories. If you think about it as a bill of material explosion, uh, you'll realize that it must know when all the uh, directories have been exploded down to the file level. So when that happens, it can decide to terminate, but it also has to tell the network to uh, bring the rest of it down. And it typically does that by closing an input port. So that's one issue. The other issue is the capacity of these connections must be large enough to hold all the possible byproducts of all the possible outputs of one pass through list directories. Um, if there's some doubt or you feel this could be a huge amount, you can put a file um, in here, which basically means putting in a writer and a reader, and um, it, which access the same file. And uh, the um, writer, uh, the termination of the writer will start the reader. So that could sit right here. Uh, the other issue, um, I guess, in, you could uh, replace all of this basically by one component, which I can do right now. Uh, this isn't necessary anymore. This one, delete that. And this one comes across and uh, is connected. Notice we've left the files up, but still there. Directories has disappeared because that's now inside this process. The trade-off is that this process becomes more complex, but the, um, you don't have the possibility of deadlocks, at least if this is designed right. And uh, uh, some people may find the whole thing, this concept, a lot simpler, although it's a more complicated component internally. That's the end of the video. Thanks for watching.